You mentioned that when you began your interest in this field, it was regarded as something quite disreputable, almost crackpot, I think you say. Mm. And that has changed now, so that, that that's very much no longer the case. And I wondered if you could tell me why you think that is. What it, what, because obviously we don't have any more evidence than we did 50 years ago. So why is it now much more culturally acceptable to be interested in this area? I wish I knew the answer to that. You're absolutely right. I was interested in this work in the 60s. One might as well well have expressed uh, an interest in fairies at that time. Only a handful of people was uh, doing SETI. Uh, Most biologists uh, thought it was uh, crazy to think about any life beyond Earth. They regarded uh, life as a stupendously improbable freak, uh, an accident of chemistry unlikely to be repeated anywhere else in the universe. And it was a completely fruitless quest to look for any life beyond Earth, let alone intelligent life. And now the pendulum has swung, in my view, too far the other way. It's now fashionable, uh, even for distinguished scientists, to say that the universe is teeming with life. I don't know where they come up with that conclusion, uh, because, as you point out, the scientific facts on the ground haven't changed one jot. Uh, Of course, the idea that the universe might be teeming with intelligent life is based on the notion that life forms readily in Earth-like conditions and that there are many Earth-like planets. We now know that there probably are many Earth-like planets, but astronomers guessed as much anyway back in the 1960s, uh, so we're no further forward. It's true that we now know life can exist in a rather wider range of environments than we thought back in the, the 60s, but that only increases uh, by a factor of two or something, the probability uh, that uh, we're going to have life out there. So uh, I think there is nothing one can point to on the scientific front to say that uh, we're now justified in believing in intelligent aliens, whereas we weren't in the 60s. So it is purely fashion, uh, and I've noticed this in many areas of science, that there are uh, are topics which uh, seem laughable or taboo for one generation that become okay, politically correct, for another generation to talk about. And... uh, You need to ask a sociologist, I think, or a philosopher of science uh, why that is, because uh, it it is absolutely correct that we're just as much in the dark about how life began, the chances of intelligence evolving, how long a a civilization would last, all of these factors which are crucial in determining if and how many civilizations there might be. We we don't know any more about those now uh, than we we did back in the 60s. I I wondered in part if if it was because the question of extraterrestrial intelligence was more linked up now than it was before, you know, because in the book you relate it to the question of the origins of life on Earth and then the possibility of a second genesis, either off the planet or within the planet, and then talk about the origins of intelligence. And I wondered if it, if extraterrestrials were in fact good to think with, in a way, and that, that was part of the appeal, whether, whether, we, whether we know they exist or not, they're actually linked up to all sorts of other important questions that we are asking about our evolution. Uh, there is no doubt that uh, this subject of SETI is a great one to exercise our Im- imaginations on. Frank Drake, uh, who began this uh, SETI project back in 1960, has said that SETI is really a search for ourselves and who, who we are and how we fit into the universe. And I think that's right. I think it's even if it's a needle in a haystack search without any guarantee there's a needle out there, it's good that we think about such things like uh, what is life, uh, what does it mean to be human, what is intelligence, what is the destiny of mankind. These are great topics and it's a great way to get young people interested in science. So I think we should do it anyway. And incidentally, it doesn't cost the taxpayer very much money because most of it's privately funded. In my own view, if um, we add up all of the factors that we don't know in trying to determine how many alien civilizations might be out there at this time, the one that is the least well-known is the probability that life will emerge given an Earth-like planet. Now, I mentioned that the pendulum had swung from the point of view in the 60s that life was a freak accident, unlikely to be repeated, to the more fashionable view now, which is that uh, the universe is teeming with life because it's intrinsically biofriendly and that life emerges more or less automatically given Earth-like conditions. So how can we test which of these uh, two extremes is correct? Well, one way we can do it is to look at Earth itself. No planet's more Earth-like than Earth. Uh, If life really does pop up easily in Earth-like conditions, surely it should have popped up many times right here on our own planet. Uh, And then the next question is, how do we know it didn't? Has anybody actually looked? Remarkably, they haven't until recently. 
I convened a meeting at uh, Arizona State University about three years ago to investigate this very question. Could it be that Earth hosts more than one form of life? Now, all life so far studied is the same life, but we haven't studied it all. Most life on Earth is microbial, and the vast majority of the microbial realm has not been properly studied. We only scratch the surface. Most microbes haven't been characterized, uh, let alone cultured or sequenced. We don't know what they are. They're just little bugs you can't tell by looking. Uh, whether they're the same life or some different life, you've got to delve into their innards and inspect their biochemistry. So this leads to the fascinating idea that intermingled with the known life that's all around us, there may be a sort of shadow biosphere that we haven't yet identified, consisting entirely of microbes. I don't suggest that there, there are macroscopic um, organisms from a different genesis, but most uh, life as we know it is microbial anyway, so that's uh, n not a great shortcoming. And so I've been trying to encourage a strategy where we go out and look for this uh, shadow biosphere, think up ways in which we might identify it, and I'm pleased to say that some of my colleagues are now doing it and they're being funded to do it. So this is a subject struggling to come into existence, and of course uh, the consequences of discovering there are two forms of life on Earth, not just one, would be pretty staggering. It would be the biggest biological discovery since Darwin, I think. You show in the book that um, human speculation about extraterrestrials goes all the way back to the ancient Greeks. But throughout the book, you point out we keep bumping into the limits of our own anthropocentrism. And it's very difficult to get beyond that. And at one point, you, you invite the reader to kind of think about what alien technology might be like, which is sort of several levels beyond our own. But it is very difficult, isn't it, to actually think ourselves beyond the, really the confines of our own immediate world. You're absolutely right. Uh, that this, uh, there's a sort of paradox that, on the one hand, we don't want to be tied to anthropocentrism, because if you look at the history of SETI, it's been remarkably anthropocentric. Uh, that I think the early reasoning was very much, well, what would we do and what are we capable of doing? Well, E.T. would do the same. Classic example, Frank Drake needed to know what frequency to tune into when he used the first radio telescope to search for, for aliens. And uh, after some deliberation, he picked a particular frequency, which is well known to radio astronomers on the basis that the alien radio astronomers would guess that that's the frequency we would use and that's the one on which they would transmit. Well, all that went away after a few years because the technology came along that enables them to look at a billion radio channels simultaneously. So nobody worries much anymore about which frequency would ET use. So already within the space of a few years, we were attributing to an extraterrestrial intelligence a different strategy just based on our own change of mind. Another example was that the, the, the feeling was that the um, in, in the 60s that extraterrestrial civilizations wouldn't really last very long because they would blow themselves up uh, by a nuclear war. Then the Cold War went away and were replaced by environmental concerns and so now people say, oh, extraterrestrial communities may last a long time but if they're transmitting they'll be doing it in an eco-friendly manner and so we go on. So I think we have to get away as much as possible from being shackled with uh, human categories and human uh, example. On the other hand, that means we're stepping totally into the unknown. And the difficulty about looking for something, if you don't know what it is, is you don't know what to look for. So we have to be guided to a certain extent by what we think is true. And never is that more the case than with science itself. Uh, many people feel, well, in this speculative game, we could make up any rules we liked. We could say, um, oh, we don't like the limitation of the finite speed of light, so let's suppose that the, the aliens can transmit messages faster than light, and then what do we look for? Well, then you just get speculative anarchy. So I think we, we need to stick within the framework of our very best understanding of science. But when it comes to technology, we have to be prepared to, uh, to think the unthinkable, really, uh, to um, be as broad-minded as possible, and just ask, what are the most general signatures of intelligence that we could imagine? Let's not worry too much about, about precisely what they would do. Uh, but let's think about if we saw a footprint of technology at work uh, somewhere in nature, how would it manifest itself in the most general sense? And we'll, we'll leave the technolo technological details to a future generation. So I think we should stick with the laws of physics that we know, 
but abandon any engineering concerns because the aliens have had a lot of time to solve the engineering problems. Paul Davis. The Eerie Silence is out now in hardback. That's all for this edition of the Blackwell Online podcast, but you can find out more about this book, as well as several million others, by going to blackwell.co.uk. I hope you'll join me again soon for another edition of the Blackwell podcast, and until then, thank you for listening, and goodbye.